Good morning, Andrews Elementary, and how are you? I hope you're doing great. It's a beautiful Tuesday. It's going to be a great day. Quick announcement. If you were unable to come get your stuff yesterday during pickup, we'll have extra times open today from 10 to noon, and then tomorrow from 2 to 4. So um, again, if those dates or times don't work for you, um, give me an email at bmcintyre at trschools.org. That's b-m-c-i-n-t-y-r-e at trschools.org. We can set up a time individually um, to get your stuff back and to return any Chromebooks or library books that you may have. Um, if you read the news yesterday, there was something about the governor opening up um, again. So hopefully, you know, Mr. Mack will be able to get a haircut here sometime soon. Um, I don't know. I haven't read the details yet. Your parents probably know more about it than me at this point because um, I was here all day yesterday seeing a lot of your wonderful faces distributing material. So um, if you remember, we are on Chapter 24 now. James and the Giant Peach, they are flying through the sky. Um, they feel like they're living the dream right now. Okay, so let's see what happens next. But up on the peach itself, everyone was still happy and excited. I wonder where we'll finish up this time, the earthworm said. Who cares, they answered. Seagulls always go back to the land sooner or later. Up and up they went, high above the highest clouds. The peach swaying gently from side to side as it floated along. Wouldn't this be a perfect time for a little music? The ladybug asked. How about it, old grasshopper? With pleasure, dear lady, the old green grasshopper answered, bowing from the waist. Oh, hooray, he's going to play for us, they cried, and immediately the whole company sat themselves down in a circle around the old green musician, and the concert began. From the moment that the first note was struck, the audience became completely spellbound, and as for James, never had he heard such beautiful music as this. In the garden at home on summer evenings, he had listened many times to the sound of grasshoppers chirping in the grass, and he had always liked the noise that they made. But this was a different kind of noise altogether. This was real music. Chords, harmonies, tunes, and all the rest of it. And what a wonderful instrument the old green grasshopper was playing on. It was like a violin. It was almost exactly as though he were playing upon a violin. The bow of the violin, the part that moved, was his back leg. The string of the violin, the part that made the sound, was the edge of his wing. He was, the only, he was using only the top of his back leg, and he was stroking this up and down against the edge of his wing with incredible skill, sometimes slowly, sometimes fast, but always with the same easy flowing action. It was precisely the way a clever violinist would use his bow, and the music came pouring out and filled the whole blue sky around him with magic melodies. Check out this illustration. When the first part was finished, Everyone clapped madly, and Miss Spider stood up and shouted, Bravo! Encore! Give us some more! Did you like that, James? The old green grasshopper asked, smiling at the small boy. Oh, I loved it, James answered. It was beautiful. It was as though it was a real violin in your hands. A real violin, the old gray scrap grasshopper cried. Good heavens, I like that, my dear boy. I am a real violin. It is part of my own body. But do all grasshoppers play their music on violins the same way as you do, James asked him. No, he answered, not all. If you want to know, I happen to be a short-horned grasshopper. I have two short feelers coming out of my head. Can you see them? There they are. They're quite short, aren't they? That's why they call me a shorthorn. And we shorthorns are the only ones who play our music violin style using a bow. My longhorn relatives, the one who have curvy feelers coming out of their heads, make their music simply by rubbing the edges of their top two wings together. They're not violinists. They are wing rubbers. And a rather inferior noise these wing rubbers produce, too, if I, say, if I may say so. It sounds like a banjo more than a fiddle. How fascinating this all is, cried James. And to think that up until now, I had never wondered how a grasshopper made his sounds. My dear young fellow, the old green grasshopper said gently, there are a whole lot of things in this world of ours that you haven't started wondering about yet. Where, for example, do you think that I keep my ears? Your ears? Why, in your head, of course. Everyone burst out laughing. You mean you don't even know that, cried the centipede. Try again, said the old green grasshopper, smiling at James. You can't possibly keep them anywhere else. Oh, I can't? Well, I give up. Where do you keep them? Right here, the old green grasshopper said. One on each side of my tummy. It's not true. Of course it's true. 
What's so peculiar about that? You ought to see where my cousins, the crickets and the katydids, keep theirs. Where do they keep them? In their legs, one in each front, just below their knee. You mean you didn't know that either, the centipede said, scornfully. You're joking, James said. Nobody could possibly have the ears in their legs. Why not? Because, because it's ridiculous, that's why. Well, you know what I think is ridiculous, the centipede said, grinning away as usual. I don't mean to be rude, but I think it's ridiculous to have your ears on the side of one's head. It certainly looks ridiculous. You ought to take a peek in the mirror someday and see for yourself. Pest, cried the earthworm. Why must you always be so rude and rambunctious to everyone? You ought to apologize to James at once. Well, all right. We're on chapter 25 now, okay? James didn't want the earthworm and the centipede to get into another argument, so he quickly to told the earthworm, Tell me, do you play any kind of music? No, but I do other things, some of which are really quite extraordinary. The earthworm said, brightening. Such as what? asked James. Well, the earthworm said, Next time you stand in a field or in a garden and look around, just remember this, that every grain of soil upon the surface of this land, every tiny bit of soil that you see has actually passed through the body of an earthworm during the last few years. Isn't that wonderful? It's not possible, said James. My dear boy, it's a fact. You mean you actually swallow soil? Like mad, the earthworm said proudly, in one end and out the other. But what's the point? What do you mean, what's the point? Well, why do you do it? We do it for the farmers. It makes the soil nice and light and crumbly so that things will grow in it. If you really want to know, the farmers couldn't do without us. We are essential. We're so vital. So it's only natural that the farmer should love us. He loves us even more, I believe, than he loves the ladybug. The ladybug, said James, turning to look at her. Do they love you too? I'm told they do, the ladybug answered modestly, blushing all over. In fact, I understand that in some places the farmers love us so much that they go out and buy live ladybugs by the sackful and take them home and set them free in their fields. They're very pleased when they have lots of ladybugs in their fields. But why, James asked. Because we gobble up all the tiny little nasty insects that are gobbling up the farmer's crops. Helps enormously, and we ourselves don't charge a penny for our services. Well, I think you're wonderful, James told her. Can I ask you one special question? Please do. Well, is it really true that I can tell how old a ladybug is by counting her spots? Oh no, that's just a children's story, the ladybug said. We never change our spots. Some of us, of course, are born with more spots than others, but we never change them. The number of spots that a ladybug has is simply a way of showing which branch of the family she belongs to. I, for example, as you can see for yourself, am a nine-spotted ladybug. I am very lucky. It's a fine thing to be. It is indeed, said James, gazing at the beautiful scarlet shell with nine black spots on it. On the other hand, the ladybug went on, some of my less fortunate relatives have no more than two spots altogether on their shells. Can you imagine that? They're called two-spotted ladybugs, and very common and ill-mannered they are, I regret to say. And then, of course, you have the five-spotted ladybugs as well. They are much nicer than the two-spotted ones, although I myself find them a trifle too saucy for my taste. But they're all, but all of them are loved, said James. Yes, the ladybug answered quietly, they are all loved. It seems that almost everyone around here is loved, said James. How nice it is. Not me, cried the centipede happily. I am a pest and I'm proud of it. Oh, I am such a shocking, dreadful pest. Here, here, the earthworm said. But what about you, Miss Spider, asked James. Aren't you also much loved in the world? Alas, no, Miss Spider answered, singing loud, long and loud. I'm not loved at all. And yet I do nothing but good. All day long I catch flies and mosquitoes in my webs. I'm a decent person. I know you are, said James. It's very unfair the way we spiders are treated, Miss Spider went on. Why, only last week your own horrible Aunt Sponge flushed my poor dear father down the plug hole in the bathtub. Oh, how awful, cried James. I watched the whole thing from the corner up in the ceiling, Miss Spider mur murmured. It was nasty. We never saw him again. A large tear rolled down her cheek. It fell and splashed on the floor. But it's not very unlikely, unlucky to kill a spider, James inquired, looking around all the others. Of course it's unlucky to kill a spider, shouted the centipede. It's about the unluckiest thing anyone can do. Look what happened to Aunt Sponge after she'd done that. Bump! We all felt it, didn't we? As the peach went over her. Oh, what a lovely bump that must have been for you, Miss Spider. It was very satisfactory, Miss Spider answered. Will you sing us a song about it, please? So the centipede did. Aunt Sponge was terrifically fat. And tremendous flabby at that. Her tummy and waist were as soggy as paste. It was worse on the place where she sat. 
So she said I must make myself flat. I must make myself sleek as a cat. I shall do without dinner to make myself thinner. But along came the peach. Oh, a beautiful peach that made her far thinner than that. Well, that was very nice, Miss Spider said. Now sing one about Aunt Spiker. With pleasure, the centipede answered, grinning. Aunt Spiker was thin as a wire and as dry as a bone, only drier. She was so long and thin, if you carried her in, you could use her for poking the fire. I must do something quickly, she frowned. I want fat, I want pound upon pound. I must eat lots and lots of marshmallows and chocks till I start bulging out all around. Ah, yes, she announced, I have sworn that alter my figure by dawn. Cried the peach with a snigger, I'll alter you figure, I'll alter your figure, and ironed her out on the lawn. Everyone clapped and called out for more songs from the centipede, who at once launched into his favorite song at all. Once upon a time the pigs were swine, and monkeys chewed tobacco, and hens took snuff to make themselves tough, and the ducks said quack, 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 quo, and porcupines drank fiery wines, and goats ate tapioca. The old mother Hubbard got stuck in the... Look out, centipede, cried James. Look out! Oh, man. That song got interrupted. I wonder what's going to happen. You're going to have to wait till tomorrow to figure it out on the next chapter. All right, friends, remember, if nobody told you they love you today, I love you all very much. I hope to see you today. If I didn't see you yesterday, have a great Tuesday.